Good morning, church. We hope that you've had a great week. We're just excited to worship together, um, and hopefully you guys are all energized and ready to go um, and clear some space in your in your living room, wherever you're at, and hopefully you guys can get up and join us and just bring the energy as we worship the Lord together this morning. Time moves in rhythm with his head Moment by moment, beat by beat Rolling through death, both kick and slay No rebel beat out, skips his feet And it might sound wild Who on earth said a song should be taken? Chases hard Mercy by mercy Note by note We lost the pitch He moved the score
as we are this morning, just to be able to come together and to worship the Lord, to give him the praise and the honor that he is due. And what a special day it is today. Um, it's Mother's Day, so we want to say a very big happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Um, just hope that today your day is filled with just joy and all the, all the blessings um, of being a mom. And hopefully you're showered with lots of love. Know that we love you guys very much as well. Um, well, at Liberty, we're also all about community, and we love to take a minute to say good morning to our friends and family and neighbors who are on live stream with us this morning. So just going to take a couple minutes in the live stream um, comments, either on YouTube, Facebook, wherever you're watching this morning. Um, just say good morning to those um, who are on live stream with you. Say happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there, and we'll see you guys back here in a few minutes. Hey church family, thank you so much for being with us today on this beautiful 80 degrees Mother's Day. And I hope that you are celebrating well. If you're sitting by your mom right now, if you're a kid, give your mom a giant hug right now. All my kids are with my beautiful wife. Give her a big hug, give her a kiss on the cheek and say thank you so much because we would not be here without mothers. So we thank you guys so much. Happy, happy Mother's Day. Hey, I just want to touch base with you guys just for a couple minutes. One, thank you all so much for those of you who have given to our hashtag can't stop, won't stop capital campaign. We're in phase one of a larger campaign to raise about $20,000 to get some technology that we can continue to live stream. And as you can see now, this is our second week with YouTube and Facebook, but there's also a lot of challenges with uh with live stream that we're learning, as well as you just can't rely on technology like you can rely on God. I just wanted to <laughs> encourage you in that. And also, if, if we ever have any technical difficulties here, there's a sound delay or things cut out, every single week we will be posting uh, our service on our YouTube channel. So if you've not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, I want to encourage you to do so. Just go to YouTube, search for Liberty Christian Church, Salem, Oregon, hit subscribe. If you're watching there right now, hit the subscribe button. If you're on Facebook, jump over to YouTube real fast, hit subscribe. Because if we ever have any tech difficulties, we'll post our service uh, uh, on the YouTube channel with no um, sound delays and everything will be back to, back to normal. But thank you guys so much for tuning in today. And again, with our capital campaign, we've been raising money for technology, for internet streaming. You guys, through your generosity, have raised close to $3,000 now in just a couple of weeks. So I just, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And your generosity, your gifts is changing lives that we're able to reach people all over the world. And I just want to let you know that last night, uh, on Saturday nights, our worship team comes here and we do rehearsals and walk through our service to make sure everything is normal and that our technology is up to par and we're ready to go and with our music and whatnot. And side note, our music team is incredible, aren't they? Uh, comment below. Thank you to our amazing musicians who are coming here week after week and coming. They come here every Saturday night as well. But last Saturday night, 
Um, last week, we talked about our friend and brother in Christ, Richard, who's walking through his own Job story, walking through cancer right now. So our worship team thought of a way that we could encourage him. So he's at a camping trip in Salem right now with uh, him and his wife. And so we got into our cars, we drove over to where he was camping at, and we brought our worship team to him, and we did a little mini church service for him. It was really fun just to be able to, to encourage Richard. Richard and Carol and family, if you're watching, hello, we're praying with you guys, and we are for you. But I just again want to say thank you all. And as we're walking forward through this pandemic together, uh, we're, we're thinking and processing through a lot of different, different ideas of how we can gather together as a community in a responsible and a safe manner. We've been meeting with our small group leaders and we have some ideas coming up. So make sure if you're part of our email list, we have some announcements coming up about small groups as well as this summer. We've got some really fun ideas about using our backyard that we have at the church or our parking lot, get an FM transmitter so you can come at least park your car in the parking lot or have some social distance uh, services outside or having, again, we've talked about a live studio audience in this church building at separated at six foot distances and whatnot, or maybe doing all three, having a small group of studio audience inside, people in the backyard, people parked in their cars, because we want to do anything we can to gather. And we also want to hear from you guys. If you have any ideas of things that we can do to reach people with the message of the gospel and be in community in this challenging time, Drop us an email, send us a message on Facebook, let us know. But the caveat is you can't just say, well, do this. You have to be a part of it and help us do it as well. But I just, again, want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you so much for being with us. And let's transition into what we are going to reflect on today. And that is the book of Job. The book of Job is probably one of the most challenging books in the entire Bible. And in fact, it is the oldest book in the entire Bible that we know. And so if you read through the Bible in chronological order, the book of Job would actually be first. So the first thing you do when you read through the Bible is Job, who says a man of uh, complete integrity, an upright man, a blameless man, goes through immense pain and suffering. And today we're going to be in Job chapter 3, which is probably the hardest and most depressing chapter in one of the hardest books in the Bible, and it landed on Mother's Day. So mothers, I am so sorry. But as I was reflecting, you know, a lot of us, we come together and we celebrate moms. We do. We, I'm so grateful for my incredible wife and for my, my mother and her mother. Again, we would not be here without mothers. But Mother's Day is also challenging for people those who have lost children, those who have lost their, their mother, sometimes they wish that we could just skip Mother's Day and move on to the next. Because being a mom, I don't know from firsthand experience, I'm a dad, but not a mom. I, I do know that being a mom is extremely, extremely difficult. And I do know that for moms, there is a lot of grief that you walk through. Raising kids is it's hard, isn't it? Being a mom is, is hard, even as your kids get older and move out of the house, the worrying. So we reflect on Job chapter 3 today. So we reflect on, on grief. So let me catch you up. If you're just joining us, we're in Job chapter 3. So Job is an upright guy. It says he, he was a man of great integrity. He was blameless, and he, he feared God, and he had everything. Last week, I said he was kind of like Jeff Bezos. I won't say Jeff Bezos' name a thousand times. I don't want to make your Alexa mad at home. Alexa, please don't be angry. I hope she turned on at your house and said, I don't know what to do. But Job was a blameless man. He was a wealthy man. He, he feared God. He had a great family. He had kids, and they would come together. They would celebrate. It says he was the wealthiest man in the entire area. Now, God exists outside, and, uh, and Satan comes to him, submits before God, and they're having this conversation. And God allows terrible things. God allows Satan to do terrible things to Job's life, takes away his family, takes away his wealth. And then in Job chapter 2, we see that Satan not only, God allows Satan not just to take away his wealth and all that he has in his home and his kids, but his health as well. 
And we reflected last week, people say, oh, health is everything. That's not true. Health is not everything. And we, we saw the picture, the image of, of Job, a man who had everything. He was a wealthy man, was living the American dream. And the image that we ended on last week was Job now sitting in a pile of ashes, scraping himself with a shard of pottery. You see, the, the contrast from where Job was to where he, he is, and then his three friends are there as well, and they're just kind of sitting there with him. It says they came and they threw ashes over their head, and they were weeping with, with Job, and they were silent for seven days. So what's interesting is the way that they were grieving, they thought most theologians believe that Job wasn't even going to live. And you think about it. Think about this guy, Joe, who had everything. His kids were taken away. His wealth was taken away. His health was taken away. So they come and see him, and he's scraping his skin with a shard of pottery, standing on a pile or sitting on a pile of ashes. They're like, man, Job doesn't have much time left. He must have done something real bad to deserve something like, like this. And so they're there weeping, imagining we think that Job was going to die. We see Job is just walking through immense, immense grief. And maybe some of you right now are walking through some, some immense and, and hard grief. You see, we have different stages of grief. I just wanted to walk through some of these stages with you. Most psychologists believe that it's about five things they list for these stages of grief. Stage one of grief is denial, shock, or isolation. And you see, if, if I was in Job's place, if you put yourself in Job's place, when terrible things happen, oftentimes, I don't know if you've seen, I've seen on chaplain calls, when terrible things happen in people's life, we don't even know what to do. We don't know how to process it. We're just in complete shock. We don't know whether to cry, to scream, to pass out, to be, to be angry, and we're just in shock. So you imagine when these messengers, they arrived to Job and said, hey, everything is gone. Your kids are gone. Your wealth is gone. Your livestock, your wealth, everything is gone. And Job said the words, I came naked from my mother's womb. I will be naked when I, when I leave, saying that we can't bring anything in. We can't take anything out. I would say in this instance, Job would be in shock. Maybe even some denial. And then he loses his health. And then Job says to his wife, who says, Job, I've seen what you've gone through. I've lost, we've, I've lost everything too. And Job says, listen, should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in this, Job said nothing wrong. Can you see the, 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 the denial, the, the shock? And they also say the first stage of grief is isolation. And where do we see Job when his friends arrive? Completely by himself, sitting in a pile of ashes in complete isolation. And sometimes we do that when we grieve. We go to a place of isolation. We don't want to talk to anybody. We don't want to listen to anybody. We just want to sit in our own misery and grief. They say the next stage of grief is anger. And bitterness, which is what Job will show in Job chapter 3, which we will read in just a minute. They say stage 3 of grief is bargaining or, or shame. That's the mentality of, if only things would have been different. Maybe you lost a relative or a loved one in a car accident. You say, oh, if only they turned left instead of right. Or, or maybe I should have just asked them not to leave and it was kind of on the fence. I, I could have stopped it. See. If, if only things had changed. Maybe Job said, if only I'd I, I done something else, is, is, is it something that I did to deserve this? That's what would be bargaining or shame. Stage four of grief would be despair or depression. Some of you might be walking through that right now. And stage five, the final step of grief is acceptance, which Job will get to in the end, in Job about chapter 40. And the thing is about the stages of grief is that you can't skip any of them. You can't just go from, oh, you know, I'm the best griever I know. Something traumatic happens in your life and you just skip from stage one, the shock and, and denial, to acceptance, boom, just like that. You really have to walk through all of these stages of grief. And as I've been reflecting on what we are all walking through right now with this 
global pandemic, the coronavirus, in the first couple of weeks, people, I think, were fairly optimistic. And I'm a pretty optimistic person. People were thinking, oh, you know, things will go back to normal. We'll just click back in and whatnot. But now we're like over two months in. And I think people are, are starting to realize, one, that the shock has worn off. The denial has, has worn off. And people are starting to see that things aren't going to be normal. And so really, all of us are walking through grief right now. And the challenging thing is that when we go through grief, usually the encouragement is, okay, go and, and be with, just check back into normal routine. Hang out with people that you love that will encourage you. But what about if the entire country is walking through grief? The grief that things aren't going to be normal. The, the grief that in uh, the next foreseeable future, weeks and months, we will probably not gather all together physically as a church community. Yes, we're gathering right now all over the city, all over the state, all over the, the world, but it's, it's not the same. But I'm very grateful that we have the opportunity to do so. The grief of, oh, we, we missed a, a baseball season. It might not be different for a long time. Can't go to giant stadiums for the foreseeable future. Culture is going to change forever. People, you know, the, you've seen the, the worries of people saying, okay, what if we can't shake hands anymore? What if we can't side hug people anymore? I love side hugs. Awkward side hugs are my favorite thing. It's my favorite way to say hello is an awkward side hug, you know, when you kind of just like kind of awkwardly, you know, let's, I don't have to show you a demonstration, but I think we're all grieving. We all go through different phases. You know, we're optimistic and we're saying, oh, everything's going to be fine. And then maybe you wake up one morning and you're just a complete pessimist. Everything, you're like, oh man, we're going to die from giant hornets. I saw that they're coming in from Asia. It's all over for us. Why even try? The economy's downturning. People are losing their jobs. It's all over. And what we're doing is we're, we're grieving. And maybe what, what we do is we put ourselves in isolation. And that's going to be challenging when we can gather together again. I think there will be some of us, not all of us, but some of us will say, I don't want to go see anybody. And again, there's one step to take responsibly, take care of yourself and be uh, responsible for your health, right? But there's, there'll be a line where it's like, I don't want to see anybody. I just want to stay in home. I, I don't want to interact with people. I just want to be in my own little cocoon and in isolation. When you just need to get out. Because what you're doing is you're, you're grieving, you're going through a lot of hard times and hard thoughts, and you need your community, the church community, to come around you and to encourage you. And again, it was so awesome last night to see Richard there, who's walking through cancer, and our worship team could come and just encourage him while he's walking through grieving, and we're all grieving together with him. So here we go with that long intro of grief. We get to Job chapter 3. Now, I would say in Job chapter 3 is about stage 2 in grief. You can really see Job going through a lot in the next chapter. So really the next 30-ish chapters, it's Job having a conversation with his friends. This first chapter, chapter 3, is Job's first speech, and then his friends will say something, and he will respond. Another friend will say something, and he will respond. And we're going to start reflecting on that next week. They don't say the best things at all to encourage someone who's grieving. And we'll talk about that in the coming weeks. I hope that you can join us. But look at these words. Again, this is one of the, the hardest chapters in the entire Bible. And we think, well, why would God include? Well, let's, let's read a couple verses, then I'll explain. Chapter 3, at last. So after Job had been there with his friends for seven days, maybe that is, uh, this is just my interpretation. His seven friends see that he's not dead yet. <laughs> they're like, oh, he's still here. Maybe they're kind of looking at him weirdly or thinking of things like, Job, what in the world did you do to deserve this? And that'll be a lot of the conversation. They're like, Job, what did you do? Obviously, you did something terrible for these things to happen in your life. And Job's responses are, I, I, don't, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything anything to deserve this. So in chapter 3, he says, at last Job spoke and he cursed the day of his birth. Now he's not saying this to one of his specific friends who are there. He doesn't say if he's saying it to anyone in particular. He may just be saying it out loud to himself. And really this is Job's first real response to his grief. The beautiful words that he said, he says, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. He's really in shock 
when he would say these words, I would assume. But after he's been able to stew on it for many days and for everything that he walked through and the loss of his, his family and his, and his wealth and everything that he knew, everything he held on to, he says in verse 3, Let the day of my birth be erased and the night I was conceived. Man, it gets worse. <laughs> let that day be turned to darkness let it be lost even to God on high and let no light shine on it. Talk about depressing. When I've talked about Job in the past, I said, before you read through it, take a couple antidepressants before you, because it's challenging stuff. And Job is saying, I wish I was never conceived. I wish I never even saw the light of the world. And he's really correlating that to Genesis chapter one, verse three, when God says, let there be light and there is life. Job says, I wish there was never any light. I don't want to see it. I just wanted to be in complete darkness from all this grief and all this suffering that I am walking through right now. The anger he must feel. He's stewing on, on this bitterness, the shame, the, the depression. He's reading through Psalms chapter 88, verse 18, which similarly says this, You have taken away my companions and loved ones, darkness is my closest friend. Maybe you, some of you are thinking, I didn't know the Bible said this type of stuff. I like it. Well, welcome. Read Job chapter 3. No one gets tattoos of this stuff, man. Darkness is my closest friend. It's a Bible verse. That's good stuff. Not really good stuff, but you know what I mean. Let's move on. Verse 4, let that day be turned to darkness. Let it be lost even to God on high and let no light shine in it. Let the darkness and utter gloom claim the day for its own. Let a black cloud overshadow it and let the darkness terrify it let that night be blotted off the calendar never again to be counted among the days of the year never again to appear among the months let that night be childless and let it have no joy how do you feel right now do you feel encouraged now me personally and we're not even halfway through yet but I have never walked through grief that Job has. I've never been at this point in my life as Job is at in chapter 3. But I know that there are some of you and some of our church family that have been here, that have lost someone so dear to you, even a child, and you've been here. And we think, well, why would God include a chapter like this or a book like this in the Bible? Because... When you need it, you're really glad that it's there because some of you have been right here in Job chapter 3. In the same way, when you fly on an airplane, right? Everyone's, I'm assuming everyone listening or watching has flown on an airplane. When you're sitting in the chair, what do they always do? The flight attendants walk you through and this is how you buckle your seatbelt. They do the little clip thing right there and they're like, underneath you, uh, there's the life jacket. So if we ever uh, crash and die into a, an ocean, you can float there until you get eaten by sharks. You know what I'm saying? But they say you have this, this life jacket. But how many of you have actually checked underneath your seat to see if there is a life jacket? Now, I don't think I've ever seen anyone be like, okay, if we ever crash in the ocean... I've never seen anyone, before you take off, they get down on their knees, they're looking under the cushion, making sure the thing blows up. But when they need it, in rare instances, they're very glad that it's there because it's needed. The same way in Job chapter 3, some of us might not even go back and look that it's there, but when we need it, when we're in the same place as Job is in chapter 3, we are very glad that it's there. You see, what else is interesting is when Job is speaking right now, one, I want you to know that Job did not see the conversation that God was having with Satan in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. He was just living his life, and all of this stuff just happened to him. He lost everything. And over the next about 30-plus chapters, God is completely silent. He's silent. doesn't say anything. Job is saying words like, let that night be childless, let it have no joy. In verse 8, let those who are experts at cursing, whose cursing could rouse Leviathan, curse that day. Leviathan was an ancient beast. We'll talk about that later. It's freaking awesome. Verse 9, let its morning stars remain dark, let it hope for light, but in vain. 
May I never see the morning light cursed that day for failing to shut my mother's womb, for letting me be born to see all of this trouble. I wish I'd never been born. And throughout all of this, God is silent. And how many of us walk through immense grieving or even things like this, the coronavirus, right? And we pray and we shout and say, God, why? Why are you allowing us to go through this? Things were going so well. And I've said things like that with the church community. And God doesn't respond. It's silent. How often do we feel like God is, well, he is silent in our grief. God, well, he's sitting in a pile of ashes. God says nothing. And when God does say something, at the end of Job, when we get there, you'll see God just kicks his butt. And Job just repents and says, God, I'm so sorry. I sit in dust and repentance. But sometimes God is silent. You see, God always has a purpose, doesn't he? See, Job didn't see the purpose. Satan didn't even know what was going on. But God, who exists outside of space and time, had a, a purpose for Job walking through this immense suffering. And even those of you who are walking through immense suffering right now, I can't explain it. There are sometimes things I can't say just to make you feel better. But to know that God has a purpose for our pain and suffering to draw us near to him. That we live not for this life, not for this economy, but for God's economy. That we focus on reaching people with the message of Jesus. That they have hope and immense suffering because there's a lot of people in our lives in our community, in our country, walking through a Job chapter 3 right now. And God comes and he, he speaks to that. So verse 10, again, Job says, Cursed that day for failing to shut my mother's womb, for letting me be born to see all of this trouble. He says, Why wasn't I born dead? Why didn't I die as I came from the womb? So he transitions. Now he moves on, not only that, he wishes he was not conceived, but he says it even would have been better if I was conceived and if I was born still. I would rather have had that, Job would say, than walking through this immense suffering. He says in verse 12, why was I laid on my mother's lap and did she nurse me at her breast? He said, I wish she would have even nursed me. I wish I just would have died and, and not even remembered it as, as a child. He said, had I died at birth, I would now be at peace. I would be asleep and at rest I would rest with the world's kings and, and prime ministers. He says, I want to be here on this earth just sitting in a pile of ashes. He says, whose great buildings now lie in ruins, I would rest with princes rich in gold whose palaces were filled with silver. Why wasn't I buried like a stillborn child, like a baby who never lives to see the light? For in death the wicked cause no trouble and the weary are at rest. And we're going to talk about this next week. But some people say, oh, why do, why do the, and Job will say, why do the wicked prosper? Why do people like Job, why do they have to walk through things like this? Why do they get everything taken away? Why do they send a pile of ashes and the wicked people prosper? Those who do wicked things have millions of dollars. They treat people poorly. They steal from people. And they have all this wealth. And we would say, oh, why doesn't God do bad things to them? And he lets bad things happen to good people. Because it's not about this life. Man, if that's what they want to live for, then do it. But we're living for the life that is to come, not this life on earth. And that's what God is trying to show us through our pain and suffering. It says in verse 17, for in death the wicked again cause no trouble, and the weary at rest. Even captives are at ease in death with no guards to curse them. Rich and poor are both there, and the slave is free from his master. Oh, why give light to those in misery and life to those who are bitter? They long for death, and it won't come. They search for death more eagerly than for hidden treasure. They're filled with joy when they finally die and rejoice when they find the grave. Why is life given to those with no future, those God has surrounded with difficulties? He says, I can't eat for sign. My, my groans pour out like water. What I always feared has come to me 
What I dreaded has come true. Jeez. And I was reading through this stuff, and, you know, I'm a pretty optimistic person. I'm like, how can I be encouraging with this? It's pretty difficult if I'm honest with you. And as we reflect, you know, in this chapter, Job is not suicidal. He's not going to take his own life. What he's saying is, I wish I had never even been here. And as I was reading through this chapter, the question came to my mind was, okay, for us walking through the coronavirus, for uh, those of us who are living on this planet Earth right now, why do we live? What is our purpose? In fact, I was watching a, a movie trailer for a kid's movie that's going to come out. It's called Soul. It's some Pixar movie. I'm a Pixar fan. I think most of the time they're pretty classic films. But I was watching through, and there's a quote in a new kid's movie coming out. It's all about, like, the before life. It's probably some Eastern mysticism type deal or whatever, like, souls before they come to the earth. And there's this quote in the movie, and the quote is, is all of this living, is all of this living worth dying for. And if I thought to myself, one, all of our children are going to have existential crises after watching this movie, right? Why do we live? But it's also an opportunity for us to reflect on this question, because if we're just living for what's on this planet earth, you're going to be depressed. You're not going to find satisfaction. Is all this living and the life that you will live, the money you will make, the home that you will buy, is all that worth dying for? No. But do you know who is worth dying for? Jesus Christ, who came and he died for you and he calls us to do the same. In fact, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says this. He says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. So the question is, even as we're walking through what our country, what the world is walking through, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what are we living for? Are you just living for a stacked 401k? Are you just living for to reach your social security? Are you just living for a nice home, wealth, prosperity, health? If that's what you're living for, my friend, you will be thoroughly disappointed. We are called to live for him, to live for Jesus. Listen, I understand that we're all walking through grief, myself included. Think of the impact this is going to have on, on my kids for the rest of their lives. In the same way as 9-11, we think of before 9-11 and a post-9-11, how culture completely shifted. That's what it's going to be, I believe, through this as well. Grieving what we had, but also knowing that this life is not everything. And maybe this sovereign pause from what God is giving us is reflect. It's not all about sports. It's not about going to stadiums. It's not even about having a good social life. It's about reaching people with the message of the gospel. It's about helping people to connect to God that when they are walking through immense grief, as Job is in chapter 3, that when they are at a very dark place in their lives, that God speaks to that, that he understands what they are walking through. And we're going to close in verse 26. Job says this. Again, this is one of the most challenging chapters in the entire Bible. He says, I have no peace. He says, I have no quietness. I have no rest. Only troubles come. And I read through this and I'm like, is Job living in 2020 right now? <laughs> is, he, is, he, is he here with us? Like, this, did, did he go back in time and, and write this verse? Because that's what 2020 feels like right now, right? We started with these crazy Australian wildfires that tore up thousands and thousands, if not millions of acres of, of forest land. It was all over the news. And then we have a, a global pandemic that literally the entire world is walking through. And then we'll probably have an economic recession coming our way soon. And, and then we have giant killer uh, hornets coming from, from Asia. Plus, on top of that, it's an election year. Like, what is the deal? <laughs> like, like, can we just get a break? I mean, because everyone's just so kind on election years, people with different opinions are always so great to one another and treat one another with honor and respect and compassion. No, you don't. 
And side note, please treat people with respect if they have a different viewpoint than you. Who cares? Because you have to think of what are you living for? Are you living for politics? Then you're going to feel like Job chapter 3 all the time. Are you living for health, wealth, and prosperity? Then you're going to live like Job in chapter 3 at times in your life. Or are you living for Jesus Christ who came and died for your sins and you let Christ live within you? Paul says again, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It's not it's about living for me. If you're living for yourself, you prideful person, knock it off. Live for, for Jesus, that you can be used by him, even in this challenging time in your life. And God has us at home right now. And again, as restrictions ease in the coming weeks, we're going to have some fun ideas, as we talked about at the beginning. But in this opportunity, how often have you talked to your neighbors at six-foot distances? How long have you said, hey, how's it going? How can I support you? How can I encourage you? How can I pray for you? I think I've talked to my neighbors more in the last two months than I have in the three years that I've lived in my current home. We, we have this crisis that we're walking through, and we view it as a burden but what if God is giving us an opportunity? And what if we're going to miss the boat? You see, I've been convicted that we've placed too much value on Sunday mornings. That that's not just church. Like, again, I, I love Sunday mornings. I love to encourage people that we come together. But when we leave, it's not like we're done. We're being sent out. You're still a follower of Jesus on Monday as the same that you were on Sunday and on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, Friday and Saturday. But we often, we just check out. Like, oh, when I'm at sporting events with other parents, oh, I'm not a follower of Jesus then, just on Sundays or when I'm at home. What are we talking about? Oh, when I'm at work, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus at church, but when I'm at work, you know, not so. Come on. God has given us this great opportunity, and we don't want to miss the boat. And what if when we can gather together again, that our church is packed out with people seeking Jesus, and it started with you reaching out to your neighbors and, and your community because all of us who are listening, all of you who are listening, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you're listening after, we all have people in our life that trust us that we can speak into them. I can't do this by myself. That's what we're all called to make disciples. We're all called to reach people. We're all called to walk through grief with our friends and our family and our neighbors, and to, to love one another. How do we let a crisis like this get in our way and say, oh, it's, it's going to stop the gospel, church growth is going to hinder, our giving is going to go, all, all this type of stuff. No. Even if giving does go down, again, as long as we're reaching people with the message of the gospel, I'm fine with that. I'm fine. If we need to turn the lights off on Sunday mornings because we have no electricity, but we're reaching people with the message of Jesus, I'm fine with that. If we continue to baptize people and walk through grief with people, because that's what we're here for. So church, again, the question is that we will close with, is who are you living for? Maybe you think, oh, it's too late for me. I've been living for myself for many. Turn it around right now. Start following Jesus right now. That he is a mighty plan and a work for your life. And as we start going back to work in these coming weeks, there will be a lot of our community that are going through some really hard times who have lost their jobs, who, has, who have lost a lot of money and finances or, or retirement, etc. And we get the joy and the honor to bring the message to say, it's not all about that. Remember, Jesus says, if you eat the bread of life, you'll never go hungry. He's not saying you'll never physically be hungry. He's saying that you, you're living not for this life, but for the next life for the eternity that you'll spend with him with no more pain and, and no more suffering and no more giant killer hornets and no more economic recessions and no more losing your retirement and no more wildfires. Because church, that is what we are living for. So I'm going to pray and our team is going to come and we're going to close with a couple of worship songs. I encourage you, if you have communion supplies at home, to take communion during this next song. And what we will sing is, Nothing else, nothing else except for God. And maybe you're walking through some immense grief right now. I want you to know that God is with you and he's weeping with you through all of this. That he knows your pain 
that he knows you're suffering. And maybe you've gotten stuck in one of these stages of grief. Maybe you've refused to accept it and let God work in your life. I want to encourage you to give that grief to him, to reach out to people that we can encourage one another and continue to reach people with the message of Jesus. Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you so much for what you're doing in this place. And I thank you for those who are listening and watching all over the city, all over the world. What we're walking through right now is challenging, and oftentimes we feel like you're silent, that we can't hear you. But God, let us know one of the songs we sing is, even when I don't see it, you're working. And you have a purpose. And maybe you've given us this sovereign pause as a great opportunity to reach people with a message. Knowing that church isn't just about me. It's not even just about gathering on Sundays. Church is such greater than that. It is our life. It is what we live for. Jesus is what we live for. It's who we live for. He came to bring us back to God to forgive us of our sins. That now when we walk through immense grief, we understand and know and see that we are not living for this life, but we are living for the life to come. And sometimes not knowing is okay. A lot of times, God, we want to know. Why are we walking through this? Why is there a recession? Why is there a global pandemic? Why? And it's okay that we don't know because what we do know is that you are good and you love us tremendously and you have a great plan for all of us. And so don't let us miss this opportunity that you have given us to reach out to our neighbors, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And let us know that as a church body, we are a sent group of people. Not just on Sundays. Maybe people watch right now and they move on from the stream and they say, oh, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to think about it again until the next Sunday. This is every day we wake up. We pursue Jesus. We walk through grief with people. And again, maybe someone's walking through some immense grief right now. We pray you speak to them. We love you and we thank you. Let us honor you as we take communion all throughout the city, all over the world, and as we worship you together. In Jesus' precious and holy name, all God's people said, amen. Thank you, church. Let's worship.
It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praise as he hears faith. so much for joining us for our, our live stream this morning. We'll see you guys back here again, Facebook or YouTube, 10 a.m. next Sunday.